and welcome to Sophie & Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. Today we're here in sunny and very windy St. Petersburg for the annual International Economic Forum where political and business leaders are looking for new opportunities. Amongst the hopeful investors is the new development bank created last year by the BRICS countries. It is hailed to be a building block of a new financial world order. Can it really become a game changer? Well, we ask its president, Kay Vukamath. The balance of the global economy is slowly shifting east as the Western-founded system of world finance falters, failing to adapt to the new reality. But can the emerging new powerhouses create a viable alternative? Will the nations of BRICS be able to make it into a cohesive force? Or will their efforts be enough to create a different world order? KV Kamas, president of the New Development Bank. It's really great to have you with us on this program, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the New Development Bank's duties, they actually overlap with the duties of the IMF, of the World Bank, of the Asia Development Bank. Do you feel like the other institutions are failing to do their respective not, jobs? Not at all. Not at all. I think the development challenge is so large. Uh, there is a need for uh, more players to come in and uh, help the process along. Just to put in context, uh, the infrastructure needs uh, around the globe are estimated at over a billion dollars a year, a trillion dollars a year, mm -hmm. and probably just 10% is met by the development banks. So there is a huge opportunity out there, and uh, that's what we are seeking. So let's try to go through that in detail and elaborate. For instance, the World Bank has a capital believed to be around $220 billion. Now, the new development bank has only $50 billion uh, ready to go. Do you feel like it's enough to stay competitive? Do you feel it's enough to spur development in the BRICS regions? You see, uh, not all that capital is required at one go. So we can always uh, access capital as we go along and grow. It'll take a few years to scale up and uh, to lend uh, leveraging your uh, capital base. And I think uh, in that time, uh, the shareholders could uh, think in terms of either getting in more money, inviting new shareholders to come in, and uh, ways and means of uh, expanding their own uh, footprint. Uh, we must remember that uh, the New Development Bank symbolizes something very interesting. It is what I call a South-South initiative. It is countries which have emerged and which in a way are standing on their own feet and saying, look, we can also be part of this development process. I know you've said that in many other interviews that the, the purpose is to show that South can do it on its own. Why do you think it's so important for the global South to go it alone? Is it to sort of assert its independence from the Western world order? No, it is not uh, necessarily that uh, the South will go alone. I think it's a collaborative effort. So they will do it in collaboration with countries in the North, the West. I think what is important is to uh, articulate that you have the means today to look at your own development agenda and uh, execute that agenda. I think in that context it, it becomes important so that countries of the South in a way can uh, set their own path and then execute it. Can you about elaborate a little bit on that please because why is it so important for the Southern countries to create their own institution? Yes, it, I'll put it in a very simple uh, context. Uh, one complaint in a way has been around the world that the development banks dictate policy. I think we want to demonstrate that we can partner in policy. We can partner with the banks around the uh, with countries around the world, which are in the developmental mode, and work with them as partners in development and execute it. I think that is the subtle difference. But I'm also thinking how the role of the U.S.-led institutions will change or maybe diminish in the region after your institution um, goes ahead with the loans and the projects. Nobel laureate, former World Bank chief economist Joseph Stiglitz, he says, and I'm quoting, New Development Bank marks a fundamental change in global economic and political power. Do you also think that the bank will diminish the role of U.S.-led institutions uh, in the know, region? I would think that as long as uh, the development banks put together meet less than 10 percent of uh, the overall developmental agenda or the need, uh, that statement may not be fully right. But in a way, it signifies that uh, there is a contribution from the emerging world to this whole process. 
But you don't think that something will drastically change in that I don't think it will drastically change because there's a role for everyone. Now, from what I gather, one of the impulses behind the new development bank was shareholdings at the existing financial institutions, like the World Bank, like the IMF, uh, that are, which are skewed towards the Western countries. For instance, China, which is the second largest economy, has less say and less clout than Benelux countries. Why do you think that the IMF has ignored call for change? I think it is, again, um, in a way, the past is still not, uh, not let go of the past. This is history in terms of uh, what's called the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, in what they thought was their role, but that role is evolving in, the, in, in today's context, in today's world. And I would think that's one reason why the change in shareholding, the increase in shareholding that developing countries are asking for has not happened. But, I mean, you, when you're a serious financial institution like the IMF or the World Bank, you cannot not realize that things have changed in the world economy or geopolitics. You cannot not realize that China plays a major role as far as the world economy goes. How can you ignore the calls for, uh, for I a change? I think uh, that is uh, the interplay of shareholders in these institutions, which is uh, forcing this. It is not the institution per se. So it's more a political thing? It would be a political uh, uh, aspect to uh, the whole uh, issue of what has been broadly bracketed as uh, the way these institutions are funded and the way they uh, operate. So do you feel like because they haven't reformed it actually in its own turn sort of forced the BRICS countries to get together and go it alone? I think indeed it's probably making a statement that in the context that the change that countries which are emerging expect have not happened, uh, we will uh, attempt to set up our own institutions. And if you see, the two institutions that were set up, the New Development Bank and the AIB. So there are two large initiatives taken by uh, the emerging countries. The New Development Bank at this point is not the only new venture, okay? We have also the Chinese-led Asia Infrastructure Bank. Uh, you can't really deny that the, 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 the spur, the, the, the nascence of these new institutions will actually break the Western monopoly, the existing monopoly of the Western institutions throughout the world. But why do you think that the borrowers will actually choose the new institutions over the already existing older ones? Yeah, one, as I said, uh, I think the market is large enough. So uh, clearly the borrowers will look for funding from wherever the funding is coming from. That's point number one. Point number two, I think what the new institutions can bring to the table are some di critical differences. And one critical difference is speed. For whatever reason, existing lending institutions, uh, they themselves admit, have a project appraisal cycle which could extend up to two years, 24 months. Uh, what we are attempting to do is trying to see what, whether we could do that in less than six months. Uh, urgency in terms of uh, need of funding and we want to bring, to bring that to the table. So that's one key differentiation that we would do. How can you sh ensure that the speed doesn't happen at the exchange of diligence, at the expense of diligence, basically? No, I think uh, this is a wrong connotation that uh, if you do things at speed, diligence will suffer. You know, I've been a development banker right from my first job. Uh, and uh, you, know, you could do things at a pace where you're clearing an appraisal of a proposal in less than two months. It is not necessary to have you know, more than that in terms of an appraisal cycle. Where it gets complex is multiple committees, you know, 20, 25 people who have to comment on a proposal, taking all those comments, giving time for each one to... Uh, so this adds up to what I call eliminatable delays. And that, if you uh, eliminate and you have a lean structure, you clearly can do things well under six months. Can you tell a viewer who is not a banker, what kind of mechanisms do you have to control the loans or the, uh, or the funds that you give out for the projects? See, initially, the funds will be basically for uh, government-led initiatives. So uh, we would uh, believe that uh, those are in sectors which are consistent with what we want to do, that is infrastructure. So it's very clear whether there's an infrastructure need, there's a gap, whether a project that is being put up meets that gap. The second is how well planned is the project. Are all the elements of the project 
uh, you know, well founded? Are they on a solid foundation? And then you move on to whether you know this is something that you would like to do or not. So the boxes are, I think, discrete, and the boxes are simple. You also said that one other thing that distinguished the New Development Bank is the bank's understanding of the problems of the borrowers in the BRICS region compared to the existing Western uh, financial institutions. But usually the difficulty with the borrower in the developing countries is that they can't always pay back the debt. So what's the difference with you? Are you going to be more so, lenient? And if yes, then does it make any sense economically and financially yeah. for your institution? Something very interesting I want to uh, comment on. If you look at these large institutions, uh, the multilateral banks, their default ratios from the sovereigns that they are lent to is very, very low, is negligible. The default ratio, if you lend to the private sector, could be higher. And that's where you need to make sure that a loan is properly secured and uh, you get back what you give out. I think we will look at private sector down the line. And most of the large institutions do not do uh, significant amounts of private sector lending. It's less than 10 to 15 percent of portfolio. So I would think the sovereign experience in lending to sovereigns has been extremely good at the MDB end. And I don't think it will be any different for And this, even from the poorest countries, they have repaid what they have borrowed. But how would you comment on the uh, way the Western institutions operate? Do you feel like they're too tough on borrowers? Do you think they should be less strict? Yeah, I think there are uh, two issues that come up here. Uh, the developing world always talks of these. One is what they call as conditionalities. Uh, and the second is, you know, trying to uh, drive policy and policy change. Uh, both can be achieved in a different way. If you and the borrowing country work as partners, the same can be achieved in the sense that your borrowing partner puts out what is it it wants to do. And you come to a common mindset, as it were, and uh, do business together. Mm -hmm. I think it achieves the same objective. And that's what we intend to do. Mr. Kamath, we're going to take a short break right now. When we're back, we'll continue talking to K.V. Kamath, the president of the New Development Bank. We're talking about the differences and similarities of the New Development Bank and the already existing Western financial institutions. Stay with us. I disagree. I have to completely disagree and disagree with what Peter, uh, what you said earlier. I disagree with you, actually. I do somewhat disagree with what I heard. This is one thing I might slightly disagree with you about. This is real crosstalk. You can't just steal money from savers and give it to Carl Icahn or other corporate raiders and think that's running an economy and doing something responsible. No, that's not. That's just moving money through financial engineering from the pockets of the vast majority of Americans into the pockets of the speculator billionaire class who adds absolutely nothing to the bottom line of America. Today I'm directing my administration to cut through the red tape, break through the bureaucratic hurdles, and make this project a priority. Keystone XL Pipeline. Keystone XL Pipeline. The, the, the Keystone XL has become a household name. But what do we know about the communities living along the proposed route? When you look at the percentage of refineries in our area compared to the amount of people with cancer, it, it's got to be a link. We're being disproportionately bombarded with the toxic waste from these facilities because we don't have a voice. Of building alliances with all different organizations and communities is very important because we were spread thin throughout the area. We went on a road trip to meet some of these communities on the front lines of resistance.
back with KV Kamath, the president of the New Development Bank, Mr. Kamath. So I want to go back a little bit uh, to the Chinese-led uh, Asian Infra Infrastructure Bank. Um, it's actually already operational and it's multilateral. It has 37 founding members. Do you feel like with only a few members, the NDB is going to maybe lag behind a little bit? It was a different model that uh, the founding fathers here, the five BRICS nations thought of. Uh, if you go back, I think uh, they thought of it as a BRICS bank. But they realized very soon that uh, uh, it can embrace a much larger agenda. And uh, they called it the New Development Bank. So as long as the space is large enough, I think uh, we can uh, each complement and cooperate. And uh, indeed, they will have certain niches where uh, they would uh, want to do, because the name itself is Asia-specific. So I would believe that uh, they would be more active in that region, whereas we probably will take a much more wider role. But clearly, our agenda is to work with uh, AIB, as indeed with other institutions, in a cooperative way. So I know that uh, the NDB has just given out its first loans. And uh, you mentioned that most of the loans were actually going, going to be for the green infrastructure. Who decides what's sustainable and what's not? I think that uh, equation today is a fairly clear cut. Uh, something uh, which is uh, you know, non-fossil uh, fuel uh, oriented, something which is renewable energy, something which eliminates waste, something which improves efficiency. In say, I'm just talking at this point in time on the energy sector would all qualify as sustainable. But I would think in a developing country context, uh, the whole issue of sustainability has to also be looked at as there's also a catch-up time. You need to make sure that, for example, which in a country which is power starved, you get up to a base level and then you green. So all these need, will need to be kept in mind. You asked who will decide. By and large, we will decide. But there are broad frameworks that have been set up in a collaborative manner by countries around the world. We will understand those, we will work, you know, tr keeping those in mind. But finally, the decision has to be ours as to what is it we would look at as green and good, which you would like to do. But what are the mechanisms of control over the projects you fund? Just one more time, are, are the governments who actually yeah, uh, initially, lend money to? Initially, all the projects would be governments, and that's what uh, most multilaterals do. The projects that you lend for are government projects. So it will be the country's governments who actually take control so who, over the funds and you borrow, trust... Who borrow and who uh, will uh, use the funds. And you don't have like an immediator controlling... Uh... Well, nothing precludes us from doing a loan to a private entity, but uh, I would think a bulk of the loans will go to the sovereigns directly. So you're now at St. Petersburg Economic Forum. Do you feel like this is a good platform to find a project that you could maybe fund? Is this a good platform for finding an investment project? See, firstly, I think what happens in uh, St. Petersburg is an exchange of thought, uh, an exchange of ideas, an exchange of opportunities. What are the opportunities? And as far as uh, being here is concerned, I think you get an opportunity to look at projects from the various provinces in uh, Russia. Uh, you get to understand what leadership is thinking. And then factor that into what you want to do uh, with uh, your strategy and uh, your way ahead uh, in uh, a particular country, in this case, Russia. Of course, St. Petersburg also happens to be a clearinghouse, as it were, to uh, businesses from around the world. And uh, you will uh, use this occasion to take that forward too. Have you come here already looking um, towards something in particular or you're just open to options and you're going to see what's going to happen? I think we are open to options, uh, but I can say this, uh, that we will engage with uh, several leaders from uh, provinces with the proposals that they could have, which could be of interest to us. All right, so the New Development Bank compared to, once again, IMF and the World Bank, where America has the biggest say, is based on um, all states are equal because every founding member has put up $10 billion and it has 20% of voting shares. But if you look at BRICS countries, their economies aren't quite equal. They're not economic equals in reality. Is it realistic to maintain this parity? That itself is uh, the interesting aspect of uh, this uh, bank, that 
very consciously, they said that uh, despite in a, what I would call proportionate GDP basis, uh, there is a difference between the five members. We will all contribute equally and we will have an equal vote. I think that is the governance structure that uh, this institution wants to uh, encourage and uh, build on. And I think it's a very interesting experience where every member has equal voice, be it large or small. That's a great beginning and uh, it's a great idea, but do you feel like it will work? Because once again, if you examine the members like the South Africa or India or China, I mean, you can't really compare the economies. What happens if, for instance, one of the states can't meet a great capital commitment? What happens then? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't uh, expect that to happen because uh, uh, it could happen if, uh, in any context, if there's a dire situation in a particular country. But when we are looking at uh, countries going through cycles, in a developmental mode, there will be cycles that countries will go through. So a couple of our members could be facing pressure today. Some others may be facing pressure tomorrow. But if you look at a long run, I think this evens out. What we have learned is once you set growth in motion, it's irreversible and uh, it will grow. You know, there are uh, cycles that happen which impact growth in a particular time frame, but it's only temporary. And you, you, you're not a little afraid that China will actually dominate because, you know, if its nominal GDP is bigger than all BRICS countries taken together. Yeah, I will not only say I'm not a little afraid, I'm not afraid at all because uh, I do not think uh, these countries would have come to the table as partners if that fear was there. So. As of now, do you see uh, the new development bank to just have the BRICS countries as its members, or do you feel like you're going to welcome other members? If you do, who do you think they could be? Yeah, our articles uh, clearly provide for new members, and these new members could be any member of the UN. Uh, I would think uh, towards the latter part of this year, our board and the board of governors will uh, uh, take a view whether uh, this is the t appropriate time to get new members in. And if they decide that is so, I think somewhere next year we, should, we could be getting uh, new members. The first year was a time to lay the foundation. I think we have uh, done that. I think the second year is the time to look at you know, going forward strategy. And uh, new membership clearly will be part of the strategy. The call has to be made by the Board of Governors. So uh, since we are not determined that we are going the route, uh, it's premature to talk of who could be the members. Sure, but you as head of this uh, great new institution, I'm sure you have an idea of who you would like to see as a new member. I think I would need to first discuss that with the board and then uh, share it wider. But on a broad basis, there are two choices. Do you look at more borrowing countries or do you look at you know more uh, the developed countries which could be just contributing to shareholders? But as I said, uh, two distinct sets. The decision I will need to discuss with uh, the Board of Governors and then uh, lay it out. All right, so let's say you've discussed it and you welcomed in new members. Once the new members are welcomed in, do you feel like the founding members will actually maintain their exclusive rights? No, I would think uh, I, uh, the AOA clearly provides for uh, what uh, is going to be the structure. The founding members will dilute as new members come in. and. Um, that has been laid out in the articles. There's a process laid out, so it'll, the process will be followed. Everybody knows what that process is before they join the, uh, the membership. So as of now, uh, the new development bank operates in member currencies. Why is it so important to you? No, uh, new uh, development bank operates in dollar as a currency. That's what uh, is an accounting currency. What I have said is that we would like to lend using member currencies. Well, the capital is in dollars, so how is that possible? I can raise money in uh, the market we operate in. So if I'm going to lend to China, I raise renminbi. If I'm operating in India, I raise uh, rupee. If I'm operating in Russia, I raise rubles and so on. What it does is it eliminates exchange fluctuations. See, one of the challenges that developing countries have faced is when a Multilateral development bank lends, or they borrow from a multilateral development bank, it looks very attractive. 1% interest or 1.5% interest. But when you add the exchange depreciation that happens over the life of the loan, your effective cost could be 
in low teens, 13, 14%. So it is not 1 or 2% with 14%. You could have probably borrowed in your own local currency if somebody could have made it available to you in uh, probably 7 or 8% at 7 or 8%. So clearly, we want to find a solution to this challenge of exchange representation, which is costing uh, developing countries dearly and uh, find alternate solutions. So basically, you want to swap local currencies without tying them to U.S. dollar. Do you feel like maybe the bank could grow completely independent of yeah, the U.S. Is, dollar? Yeah, in fact, I'm not even saying swap. I raise money in uh, China. I give it to a uh, Chinese uh, business uh, in renminbi. I could also swap that currency if there's a market in other uh, country currencies. I could swap renminbi into rubles or renminbi into rupee and uh, lend it if it is attractive enough for uh, the borrower and no exchange risk on the borrower. Uh, will it completely eliminate uh, the need for being other... Being tied to U.S. Yeah, as a reserve currency. I would think that uh, there is... I wouldn't think it's a question of being tied to. It's a question of where is it that you can access the lowest cost funding. And we will uh, follow that route. I think there is a seriously, uh, you know, good opportunity to look at local currencies and uh, reduce the cost. So we will try to maximize that to the extent possible in our own borrowing program. So just to complete the thread, the very first loan we will uh, raise ourselves is in uh, China. It's an NMB loan, and uh, it, we should be in the market. Uh, it's a bond issue sometime this month. And uh, we believe that that could be a trendsetter. Kevin Cam is head of the New Development Bank. Thank you very much for this wonderful interview. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you.